Thank you so much for being here today and take it away. It's all you. Thank you so much, guys. I, I want to say thanks, J Jason, David. Uh, I don't know with you, but people who are running uh, uh, the thing here, I appreciate it having me. We were just talking about how amazing this is. Uh, I see Alex, which I've played a gig with Alex before here. So it's, uh, you know, it's cool to see to people. I don't know everybody, but some of you look familiar, maybe Facebook or something like this. Anyways, it's, it's, good to, it's great to be here. Uh, I should say, my, you know, again, my name is Lucas Borges. I teach here at Ohio University. You hear a little bit of an accent, just a little bit. That's my go-to joke. Of course, you hear a lot of accent. I'm from Brazil. Uh, I'm you know, not originally from Athens, Ohio, uh, but I've been in the U.S. for a while. Jason and I went to IU together. I think that's the bunk of the story. So let's talk about the warm-up. I sent everybody a warm-up package. Uh, do you prefer that you look on your end and would just talk about it, or you rather me to uh, screen share? Just, uh, screen share? Yeah, what do you all think? Would you rather have me just post the file in the chat so you can look at it on your own, or do you want us to share it on the screen? What's easier? Screen share. Okay, Dave, can I share screens, or uh, do I have the power? Uh, yes, you get the authority to share a screen. Actually, everyone does if you want, but only right, one of the so. two. Right. So you you will do it, Jason? Yeah, I got you. Let me pull it up here. Cool. And gorgeous. And you know, one thing sometimes I get excited and I speak kind of fast, and again, I got the accent and stuff like that. So if you need me to repeat, please repeat. Please let me know. I see a little cute, cute baby there. That's cool. Awesome. Cool. So I, I was telling them, I, I did this warm up about a year, a little over a year ago at ATW. And here's the basic ideas, right? So I divided the warm up in five parts <clears throat> you know, body stretches in air, uh, sound and slow slurs, tunes, we'll talk about what that means, flexibility, range, articulation, and interval, and cool down. And in general, the general idea is like you can do in however or uh, well, however you want. You can use other exercise. Which I, what what I do my make my students do is sort of keep the same order and make sure they hit all the things. That's what matters to me. Uh, over time in the school year, we go through several uh, warm ups, and then people start making their own package per se. Uh, as far as focus go, and I think you hear a lot about focus of attention. That idea is very important uh, to me. I got mostly from Jan Kagarais. Uh And one thing that's very important, you know, you, you heard this a million times, is you really have a clear idea of how we want to sound like, like and strive for that, for it constantly. Uh, uh, it seems uh, too simplistic, but it's true. I, I, and I think now in the warm up is when you want to train your brain to concentrate on how you want to sound like, right? Uh, I also like the idea, I was starting for a complete uh, point of comfort, you know, place where you feel, e where things are easy. There's not, you don't have to try really hard. And from that point, we start stretching out, to, out of the comfort zone slightly. And play everything, everything with a musical intent. That's something, you know, Carl Lenti used to say a lot, and it was hard to grasp on the first time I was hearing him talk about it. But once you started doing that, it really changed, at least with me. Cool, so body stretches in there. <clears throat> stretch, I'm not gonna do much, just very basic stuff like this. Uh, I'm not Jason at all. Jason actually knows the science behind this stuff. He could do a, a one hour class on these things. But I, again, I used to do this with him at IU in warm ups and really changes your first approach to trombone. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. Uh, just something to kind of get my body relaxed. This past year, I was lucky enough to have a grad student who did his undergrad, most of his undergrad in kinesiology. So he knew his stuff really well, so it was good to have him run that part of it. And then here. Yeah, UNT's actually got that really great connection with the uh, with uh, Chris Chesky. Correct, yeah. Runs the center there, and so there's a lot of overlap. And then obviously uh, with Kagaris being there uh, for as long as long Exactly, as well. that's exactly right. Uh, yeah. Cool, so as far as air goes, I really like to focus on, on the outward of flare, outward of flare air rather than inward. So it's about air moving out and less about air coming in. Of course, air coming in is very important. Just the focus, it's about moving air out, blowing, right? So one exercise that I do that's pretty simple and I do 
with a pinwheel. That's a this Stewart idea, which is just a good visual tool. Uh, uh, I just blow ten times out like this. Three. Just do it together. You don't have to use a pinwheel. You can use a piece of paper or nothing. Put a metronome on. The main thing here is focus on blowing. Right, your focus is moving the air out. Together, one and two and three. So one thing that may happen here is you feel a little dizzy. Anybody feel dizzy? Cool. So you feel dizzy. It's okay. It will happen, all that. But it, it means there's either too much oxygen or too little oxygen go, going in your brain. And none of them are really good for you, right? So, uh, uh, you don't want to be hyperventilating or hypoventilating. So take your time. Don't try to be, you know, macho man and, oh, I can do it. No, that kind of stuff. Not smart. Take some time. Do it again if you need to. I hope, does it make sense? Thumbs up. Okay. Let's do it again. <clears throat> again, you probably notice that, you know, I'm, I'm, my, my cheeks are uh, puffing. Uh, I'm not holding an armature. I think that's actually very important. And right now, you're not, you're not working on your chops. You're working on your air. And don't start putting unnecessary tension in it. Just relax. <sighs> right? Just uh, focus on, on the air. And again, it's very common for even young players to just go out, really all the tension, and no, 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 zero, none, just air, air, okay? Do it again. One, two, and, oh, metronome, sorry. One, and two, three. Sometimes when I have more time, I do some other things. But for time's sake, we we'll stay on this, okay? There's some things Jen does with blowing air into the horn, and I'm not going to too much, go too much into it now. But we, let's just do a little bit. Just uh, 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 just gonna blow air out, nice and easy, with the same sense of freedom we were having, just blowing air, but inside the horn. But key, the key thing here is your focus of attention, it's got to be on air straight out of the bell, right? Not air going here and then out of the bell. The trombone now, it's part of your body, right? Your brain's smarter than you are. It maps the trombone as part of your body after a while, after you've been practicing. So you know, uh, so you focus on sending the air out here rather than in here through there. Sounds, sounds make sense? Okay, so just blow air, nice and easy. In the horn, using your horn. Again. And I want to make, you want to make sure you put your horn down in between. Give it some time. So, so, so you're not establishing bad habits, right? So put, the horn needs to go down very, very often. Because we all have bad habits. Uh, you know, David and I were talking about since we were 14 years old, whatever. So you want every time the horn comes up, most of those habits come back in. And again, Jason can explain this a lot better. There are neural pathways that have been created a long time ago, and they are there. So you want to put it down, establish new habits, right? Let's do it again. Focus on air uh, falling out of the bell, straight out of the bell. Okay. So again, three. And then listen for the sound. If it's the sound you want to come out of your bell, right? You don't want any interference. You don't want to have, like feeling like it's getting stuck in the middle. And straight out of the bell. Again. Cool. I could go on this, but without feedback, seeing what you guys are doing, this is not as effective. Cool. Now I go into the Sunday. Uh, 
the key thing here is we all play whatever it's the easiest note for us on trombone, right? All of us have a note that you blow the horn, you don't feel like you're doing anything, and sound comes out. Often, uh, that's F, middle F. For me, nowadays, it's actually tuning B flat. It used to be F, but nowadays it's tuning B flat. So whatever that note is for you, low B flat, whatever that is, just blow that note once. Just find a note. We do it separately. Cool. That's, that's my basis for everything I'm going to do now. For the sake of everybody, we're going to do Lissandos starting in F. So I'll play and you play back. Uh, So again, here you want to really have the idea of sound you want to have in the trombone and going after that constantly, right? One thing I want to listen to when I'm doing this, I don't want my sound to change colors too much. I don't want it to be ba ba ba. I want la. Cool. Tuning B flat. <laughs> Now the next pattern. So again, the same idea. You want a consistent, consistent. I'm not sure consistent is the best word, but a sound that's not changing colors too much. Okay, all the way through. F. Easy. So from now on, ideally, if you can not look at the music and just concentrate on the sound for a little bit. Again, in the morning, when I wrote this down because when you do things like this, you want to have it in paper for people. But with my students, often I ask them not to have music at all. So we only concentrate it uh, in the sound itself, and how to produce the sound rather than reading, which uh, seems simple. But again, it's just training our focus of attention to be in the music. Lucas, quick question for you. When you're doing these uh, triplet patterns, um, I, I know when I do these triplet patterns, I tend to, um, I tend to not be very rhythmically precise. I it's almost like I'm just moving the slide and just kind of, you know, it's like I'm spraying the hose of water onto my lawn. It's just very, you know, and then not that it's not musical, but just that it's not very rhythmically precise. I mean, do, are you worried about rhythmic precision with your students? Excellent question. Not, not here. No, no, it's, uh, it's, I ride that way because when we play it together, so we have a general sense of rhythm, but it doesn't have to be precise. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate the questions if, if they keep coming. Uh, so now, starting on seventh position, so again, if we could not look at the music, it would be ideal. <laughs> First note, now play it. One and two and three and go. Cool, and this shouldn't be hard at all. It should be just okay. Uh, trigger, vowel. Cool. 
Sometimes at this point, I, I blow the pillow or something to me, remind myself of free air. Air needs to flow free, okay? Then, again, if, uh, let me play and then we'll sing. Sing. Now play. Trigger. Sorry. Ah, oh, that's right. I'm skipping one part. Sorry. So long. Then play. Again, only if it's easy. Just air three and go. So if this is getting hard, don't force. It's got to be easy. You got to feel like you're blowing a recorder rather than playing a trombone. Right? Now, pedal be flat. So when you go to when you go to the pattern notes, I, I think it's as important to be singing those notes. Because our tendency, all of us, is to kind of overshoot and go too low on them and play them kind of soggy and out of center. So have that tune. Uh, be singing in your head so you match in that pitch. Okay. Now pedal F. Trigger, of course. Cool. Easy? Feeling okay? Okay. So now I go to, I go to some sort of uh, lip slurs, or oh, not lip slurs, sorry, long tones ish thing. I give two options here. You definitely don't want to do both of them in one day. One or the other, uh, it's just two options that I like, so I wanted to put both of them there. But you don't want to do both of them. We're going to do the, the first one, most of you probably know, it's the Jack's, uh, James Stamp one. Uh, so let's play it together. So here, again, I'm thinking Brahms one, French horn solo, that type of sustain, that type of continuity in the sound, that's what I'm going for. Okay? Have that whatever your bad bass trombone or bad bass trombone sound you have in your mind match that. For me, it's a compilation of several play people that I like here and playing, and trying to find that sound. <clears throat> I'll play and repeat, and then eventually we we'll go together. One, two, three. <laughs>
one thing, uh, if you have the time, you have your students in these breaks, maybe you can be singing, sing in the piano before you play. Again, so it's as vocal as it can be and really getting used to that idea. <clears throat> uh, G, let's do it together. One, two, three. <laughs> Metronome, it's very important. This slow music is really when you want a metronome because it really is easy to forget and not be concentrated. So, have the metronome in G flat one, two, three. <laughs> Brahms-like song in my head, and that way I can check if my slide coordination is correct. If I'm hearing Glissando, that's not the Brahms sound that I, I, I wanted to have, right? So what I'm trying constantly is to have this record playing in my brain, and I'm playing along with it, and we'll see if they are matching. And if they're not, and I'm not judging if they're matching, just noticing if they're matching or not. Over time, very small adjustments make sure they match. F, one, Two, three. E natural. One, two, three. time and I feel that I would need more of this, I go on. Uh, but for now I think that's enough. Let's move on. Uh, let's move on to slow slurs, uh, Jason. I, I, one thing, it's written in the package. I don't think there's anything in this package that's new. Zero. It's just a compilation on how, uh, and how I put it together. That's all it is, right? Uh, Anybody have any questions so far? I don't think I has said anything that's too contradictory. So, but if you do, please let me know. Cool, good. So, so the next thing that's very important for me is really slow slurs, which is sort of what we're doing. But this is just like moving through the partials very specifically. And what I'm looking for here, it's essentially I'm blowing like a glissando always, meaning there's no stoppage in between uh, the partials, and just. One, one no morphs into the next one. It's a complete connection. That's what I'm going for. And again, for me, metronome is key. I had a 66 now. Which I think this is simple enough that we can probably pay together. Thumbs up. Okay. Well, let's give one measure in between each one of those. Okay. One, two, three. <laughs>
like with the other ones, if you feel you want to go longer, you play bass trombone, or you just want to work on your uh, valve range, go ahead and do it. Okay? All the way up to D. Again, let me play once. Let, uh, hopefully I can play the way I think it should be played. Really, no tongue in between the notes. As connected as possible. One, two, um. I hope you can hear that. No bumps whatsoever. This is the what I'm aiming for. Let's do it together. Same thing, we're going to put a measure in between. And if you want to play that note a little longer, the, the low B flat, that's fine. One, two, three. So again, it's just an extension. We're just adding partials. I just like to do this one rather than just B flat all the way up to F because it sounds more musical to me. Again, this idea of trying to, even when playing these notes, trying to sound like music, having a, a musical intent behind, it's way easier when the exercise actually sounds like music. Uh, uh, this exercise is important, but I, I, again, I want to train my brain to every time this comes to my face, my focus is on the music. So when I go on the stage, that's not a new feeling. Oh, now all of a sudden I want to focus on the music, right? So I, I want to train that constantly. Uh, I found that that helped me, uh, you know, dealing with anxiety over time, right? Not, but over time, practicing this way, really think this way, made my anxiety levels in performance go way lower than used to. It all has to do with the focus when I'm practicing. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's do this together again. You want to sound as musical as you can. I always tell this story. One time I taught in this festival, uh, and uh, Russell the Visit, uh, his principal, he was foreign principal in the Toronto uh, Montreal Symphony, uh, assistant principal uh, trumpet. And you know we were there warming up different rooms, and he played this, and I was like. Holy crap, it's just, just beautiful. Like, it sounded like a concerto, and that day it really popped to me. It's like, man, I'm not playing this right, I'm just playing it. He plays like he's in the nicest concert hall, and he's having to sell the music. And that's how we, you should play this stuff, okay? Let me play once. <clears throat> It depends. Now, for time's sake, let's do, do without it. Uh, G, one, two, three. 
to go down and maybe it's time to now it's time to check check your posture assess your awareness so you know as a plane you want to be aware of what's going on and now when the horn goes down you're like okay what well, wasn't quite right about the way i played maybe that's not even the best word but just how did it feel are, are my shoulders going up all these little things we learn when the horn goes down i check those make sure they're in place then i play reset I hope that makes sense. G flat. One, two, three. Again, relax. One, two, three. Again, one of the most most important things I'm trying to teach myself is to only analyze or check or all the stuff. Once the horn's there, once the horn is in my face, my focus is on the tasking hand, which is making the music. I'm trying to get my body used to that. It's not easy. Uh, yeah, move on. Go cool, tunes. Okay, so here here is maybe it's a little weird. Even though Arnold Jacobs used to talk about this, uh, but I really got, I, I remember actually Coral Anthony at IU kind of bring that up to me. I, I remember one day showing up to a lesson with him. It's like, oh, how does the Brazilian anthem goes? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I kind of, kind of sang it kind of badly. And he's like, can you play it for me? And I'm like, uh, sure. And then I couldn't really play it, right? And then he was talking about, you know, uh, you got to be able to hear and play, hear and play right and so the first time i was exposed to it in a more direct manner and it was pretty intimidating and i couldn't do it i felt really embarrassed right then in north texas that's something that jane makes every, all her students do you gotta play s several tunes and you gotta play in all 12 keys uh and you test it on it just like jazz musicians do right uh and i think here especially the idea especially if you haven't done before it's really played extremely easy tunes uh and one key thing you gotta allow yourself to make mistakes right Vern used to say this uh, allow yourself even to fish which is something that often we don't allow ourselves to do in order to, uh, to uh to keep hearing the tune in your head and and find where the notes are with your ear Vern was when a little more extreme he would he would say i don't even even to be thinking about theory at all i want you to think just sing in your head and try to find the notes in the trombone. So, so, so your brain's not uh, not confused, or, or it's not losing attention to anything else but the sound itself. And that was a huge challenge for me. And it goes into the heart of what being a musician is, and most of my problems, right? I was thinking, you know, I have my embouchure, my posture, whatever. But most of the problems were right here, meaning I don't really know how the music sounds. I recognize it, but I don't know it. And those are very different things, right? And so this helped me get to that. And the other thing is, again, I'm bringing Coral Anthony a lot today, but he used to say, you know, trombone players, we take the horns out of the case to warm up, and then we shove the musician in the case and, and close it, right? So this is a more practical way of you thinking musically because you're actually playing a tune. Okay, so in cases like this, usually I do uh, Art to Joy, because it's a tune all of us know, right? All of us feel uh, comfortable possibly playing. Let's do F major, it's a comfortable key, so it means it starts in, uh, with A. I can play once, and then we all play it along together. Uh, And 
again, I'm trying to be as expressive as I can. I'm not trying to play like marching band. Bam, bam, bam. Not at all, right? I'm trying. If somebody's walking by here, they're like, man, that's such a pretty tune. What instrument is that? I do, you know, uh, that's what I want. Okay? Uh, so let's play it together. F major. Starts in A. Good luck. If you don't get it, fine. Fish. Keep air moving and singing and try to figure out. One, two, one. to keys which what I do and I use and I and, and I go a little higher a little lower a little higher a little lower a little higher a little higher until I really expand my range and I'll get to keys that are uncomfortable to me but they become more comfortable over time especially by playing tunes it's very useful in many ways for instance who thinks and let me put uh, if I could see all of you it would be great but who's struggle with intonation in their life Right, like the story of my life, right? Intonations is, is the, the hardest part. Uh, uh, uh. But one key thing was I sometimes being 100% honest, I couldn't hear. I couldn't really tell. Because my trombone teacher in high school was very good, I learned really early how to blend in a section and play into in a section because he would t teach us cool. That, but when I played the solo, it was just awful, right? Nobody wanted to hear that. But it was, uh, you know, it was too abstract to me. Uh, so my doctor, you know, I was a pretty okay trombone player at that point already. And they forced me to do these tunes. And that's really one of the clicks for intonation for, for me. Because if I play this tune, we want to just play it like this. My grandmother, who doesn't know anything about music, knows it's out of tune. You don't have to be a genius. Does it make sense? Again, there's a clear, very clear model going in my brain because I've listened to this music enough and I'm trying to match that. So I don't need my teacher saying, oh, you know, that second position is flat, whatever. You know, the third position. I'm actually engaging my ears. And that for me was life changing, yet ego destroyer. Because when I couldn't play Mary Had a Little Lamb in tune, I'm like, holy crap, I'm bad. Right? I apologize for the language. But it's very ego destroyer, but also helps. And then when I turn that, instead of being like, oh, mad at myself because I'm so bad, I'm like, well, can I play this music well? And turn that in positive energy. Then the effects over time have been great. Does that make sense? Uh, let's do an octave below, starting in low A. Uh, one. challenge here to keep uh, so you see, there are so many things we're working on to keep the air moving through right making nice long phrases who's been watching Jim Marcus uh, posts right so inspiring like like holy you know just there's so much to learn there but he talks about this all the time he plays things down octave and he shows the struggle to get those things in tune sounding good but again the the message that he's sending to his brain now it's absolutely crystal clear so through correct good repetition uh with a clear going mind the improvement is actually much faster when you're just doing repetition with a, without a clear goal 
not very not not the improvement's not really uh efficient. Does that make sense? Okay, starting on the guys, i if we were live in my studio, we will all be singing together, but this is gonna go you know, in the internet, so maybe I, I don't want to sing. I probably should anyways, but whatever. Uh, so, uh, D, one, two, three. Wise, feeling good, feeling cool. So you see, this can be a bit more pleasant than playing just lips, you know, whatever, and very effective. I know it feels a little, and I'm being 100% honest here, it feels a little embarrassing. But man, you know, you're a college professor and you're playing Mary Had a Little Lamb. What the hell? Sure, but if I can't play, it doesn't matter whatever uh, doctor I have, I gotta play simple tunes in, in tune. And the better you get this, start making little challenge to you. Learn a tune by year. Again, by year. You got to learn by year. Because you got to engage this every week and try to go through different keys. Jazz musicians do this all the time. Is anybody here primarily a jazz trombonist? If you, if you are, this is nothing new to you. Uh, oh, oh, you, oh, you are. Yeah, so, you know, it really helps. Cool. A flat major. So it starts in C. And let's go this range here. <clears throat> okay, one, two, mm. <laughs> circle fourth so that, that's how I'm going you can go however you want to do um, Jen's got a great uh, Jen categorize great system she does she does two keys a week on Mondays B flat and E Tuesday a and, and, uh, and E flat then we always play a, a easy key and a hard key easy hard you know uh, uh, it's really helpful cool uh, so D flat starting low low F if you're already feeling good, maybe starting here. Let's do that, okay? Make sure it's musical. One, two, um.
right? So you go to get all this convincing, musically convincing. Cool? And the more you do this, you know, you're going to be playing in some keys, and you're like, I don't even know what note I'm playing, but I'm playing it. And that's kind of mind-blowing a little bit so when the brain takes over and it does the job for you. And that's what you want it to happen, right? People talk about muscle memory being a bad thing. Well, sometimes it's a good thing. When you're getting nervous and you practice it correctly, you want it to take over so you don't have to worry too much about it, right? Again, Jason can talk about those things a lot better than I can. He knows, actually knows the science behind it, that. Any questions on this before I move on? Not a question so much, but I just uh, wanted to just throw an idea out there because I know you talked a bit about intonation and it's very uh, interesting. I don't know if any of you follow Noah Kagiyama. He uh, does the Bulletproof Musician. He's a mental coach at Juilliard. Um, but he, he has a, a blog and a podcast and his last one that came out on Sunday was actually specifically about intonation. It's about an hour discussion about like harmonic intonation versus like just intonation or tempered intonation versus like melodic intonation. So if you're anybody's curious about like unpacking all of that on a deeper level, it's uh, I haven't got all the way through the, the blog yet or the podcast, but it's a pretty, a uh, pretty lengthy discussion. So if anybody's curious, check it out. It's a, you know, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to check that out for sure. Cool. Uh, I, you know, to be honest, I'm kind of having fun here and I noticed it's 1055. Is it time to stop? What's the timing on this? You can keep going as long as you want. I mean, I think people, if they need to go, will probably duck out. But I'll need to leave at 1130 to go teach, but I can always pass the host um, to make one of you guys the host and keep going. But I'm, I'm, I'm good at least for another 25 minutes. Cool. I'm not going to go that long probably. Uh, so, if, so if you guys are okay, I'll, I'll, I, you know, I can do this all day sure. long. This is my thing. I know, I just, this is what I like to do. Just, I guess, you know, as soon, when you're the only one left in the room, then you know it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, but, it just kind of takes care of itself, right? right exactly, yeah. Okay, yeah, let me go back to the sharing and I'll, uh, I'll post the, uh, the, the stuff. So actually, I should say this then. Uh, to all of you who came, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I really do uh, appreciate spending the uh, morning with you all. Can I can I ask a I don't want uh, just one question for you because and, and we don't want to have to make a big discussion out of it but you mentioned like Jan was talking a lot about developing focus in the practice room and you know can you maybe talk a little bit about that and what you learned from her about that and just how you approach all of that Yeah, uh, cool. I, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, first disclaimer: I was never a student of Jan. Like I was never in her studio. I studied with Vern, which was um, her, her husband. But at UNT at that point, uh, they had this uh, TF meeting. So all the people who were teaching fellows. We were very close to them. And Jen kind of took me, I don't know if she intentionally, but she was so nice with me. She would spend so much of her time with me talking about teaching. You know, sometimes hours, like she would just like help me a lot. And, and I felt that my teaching just went like, and she was very picky, you know, because we had these weekly meetings and she they would check on students, how we were doing, what we were doing. And uh, so through that, I was highly exposed to her ideas, right? So, and I would try to go to her master classes in her studio. That's something I always did as a student when I was at IU. I know every summer I took lessons with Carl Lenti or Dee Stewart, even though I was a Pete Allison student, right? So trying to really stay curious and, 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 and learn those things. So just as a disclaimer, Jen wasn't my teacher, so, uh, so she doesn't feel that I'm stealing anything. Well, cool. But Jen, uh, you probably, for those who don't know, Jen Kagarais, uh, she taught uh, uh, North Texas a long time now. She, she runs a company called, uh, uh, I gotta remember the name, it's Wellness of America. I'll look it up and I'll send it to you guys if it's the case. Uh, but she often treats people that have some sort of uh, uh, injury uh, uh, in playing, M most of the case, focal dystonia focal test specific dystonia. So she really see thing, sees things from that perspective, from somebody who had to help somebody rebuild their lives and their careers. So, so she always, uh, she, she looks with very pre uh, preventive eyes, right? She doesn't want injuries to happen, especially long terms, especially uh, neurological problems that really can destroy your career. Does it make sense? So all, all her teaching is based on um, essentially, fundamentally, where your focus is when you're playing. So you're not sending the incorrect message to your brain and end up breaking a, a pathway 
and, uh, and which essentially cause uh, focal dystonia. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, one bo book that she always suggests, uh, uh, it's by Gabrielle Wolf. Uh, uh, Teaching Learned Motor Skills, I think. I, I, I'm having all my titles messed up here. Uh, but the book, it's a great book, not fun to read at all, very technical. You know, Jason, he will eat it up in two seconds. It took me forever because I had to reread it so many times. Uh, uh, but essentially what it talks about, it's uh, external focus of attention versus internal focus of attention, right? And this uh, Gabrielle Wolf, she, she teaches at the University of Nevada. She did tons and tons of research on how when people have the external focus of attention, they tend to learn it better, quicker, and retain skills for much longer. Right? Uh, and so, so, so when I'm playing the trombone, if I'm uh, focusing on my chops, I'm sometimes taking some of my brain power away where it should be, right? There's some things that my uh, uh, cohort, Daniel Cohort, talks this way. My unconscious brain, unconscious brain takes care better than my conscious brain. Sometimes I got to tell my brain what's the action I wanted to achieve and allow my brain to, to figure some things out. Uh, so that's essentially how, how, how Jane goes about it. Again, this is very crude. But it's essentially how she goes about it. And one thing she does often with people go study with her, and it's honestly for a lot of people extremely frustrating. You get there and she's gonna destroy everything you know about breast playing. She's, she's gonna and but she's gonna rebuild you up and you're gonna come out on the other side like whoo! Sounding like you never sounded before. And I've seen that happen several times. It's mind blowing. She's very intense. She, she's extremely smart, and she's a very demanding teacher as well. Uh, but she's also very uh, aware of psychology and, and how to, again, guide, guide people's focus. You know, she always taught us that, you know, you are not a teacher, you are a guider. You guide, right? Uh, you don't really teach anything. You, you, you just you, you guide their attention. So it's very much based on those ideas. So fundamentally speaking, uh, when you're playing, you're focusing on the results you want to achieve. And that can be very distant or very general, like the music, but also can be very specific, like an articulation uh, or a specific sound. Does that make sense? I hope that. Yeah, it does. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, she, she's sometimes uh, a little controversial, but if you have a chance to experience her, her teaching, I uh, highly, highly, highly recommend. Uh, you know, just mind blowing. Yeah, and, and Lucas, I posted her website, the uh, the musician wellness website that she has. That's what it is, yes. I posted the, the Wolf book as well. The, yeah, you, you probably know that book, right? The Attention and Motor Skill Learning, yeah. That's, that's what it is. Yeah. yeah, so there's an Amazon link in there, and if you want to, I'm, you may, some of you may even find some of it online, you know, if you wanted to use some spurious ways of doing that. Did, did Jeremy Wilson come and teach here already? No, not yet. Yeah. No, Jeremy, we, should totally, we should totally contact her, yeah. yeah. He's highly influenced by Jen, too, just putting out. Oh, there. I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about Jen. Who, who did you say? Jeremy, Jeremy Wilson. Oh, yeah, oh, Jeremy yeah. Wilson did a session, yeah. Yeah, he was on. Another chat, uh, a question came up in the chat. Uh, it was just sent to me privately, so maybe it's just, uh, I don't know if it was necessarily directed at me or just kind of a private com a question, but I was just going to throw it out there and we can have a general discussion about it. You know, how can we develop a high register and go to the high notes like in the bolero without pushing too hard? I'm not quite sure if we're talking about pressing with a mouthpiece or pressing with the air or something like that, or maybe just developing ease up there. But is that something we can maybe, maybe could you speak to that? And if anyone else wants to throw in ideas, we can have a general conversation about that. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so if, if you don't mind me jumping in, right? But I, I do have lots of ideas about it. Uh, one is, it's, and I'm jumping in because we were talking about doing it right now, it's the tunes, man. It really is like, uh, uh, one thing about Bolero, and now is use the example, it's uh, Francis, which is a high note. Uh, it's, we don't hear the B flat coming in, right? We hear the wrong notes, 
and we're trying to find where it is here in the lips. And all of this is very important. I'm not saying this is important. But it's a much more fundamental problem that we all have that we don't want to admit that we have. We don't know what we're shooting for. So if you don't fix that problem first, everything else is useless. So if you cannot sing, and, and that's one of the reasons I think people are very much into buzzing, right? Because you're going to check if you can hear the pitches correctly or not. Trombone players don't want to sing. So we want something mechanical that looks mechanical that we can prove that we know what the right thing is. Does that make sense? Uh, so, so when you're playing bolero, only high note stuff, we often don't know. So when I do tunes out of keys, especially over time, sometimes before I know I'm playing notes that I've never played before. Because I get there and I know absolutely for certain what sound I want. And as long as I put it in the right position, it pops. And we know past high F, there's not really high right position, right? <laughs> Everything, you know, there is, but, but you know what I mean, right? You essentially can play anything, any note. And when you look at Minor Ferguson and all these guys who play really high, all those guys that have one thing in common, they really hear pitch really well. And I, again, Jason can probably speak to this a lot better than I can, but people uh, hear things very differently. And you have to figure out how you hear uh, things and what you need to develop. For instance, my wife is a flute player she cannot really hear things really well bes uh, below low C. She's a woman, and she probably and she the flute you don't play below that. She so she doesn't distinguish, distinguish sounds very well down there, right? So for high notes, I notice in my peak it's about where I can sing, and really hear clearly. Besides that, it's all kind of fuzzy. If I spend a lot of time singing in that range, so singing down an octave, trying to hear up, up an octave, sometimes playing the piano up an octave and singing an octave below, really make sure I know what I'm aiming for. Then, then for our, our brain will be much easier to actually achieve those things. So I really think the tunes ideas, and again, it's got to be, if you try to do this playing down a Lee, you're dumb. Because your brain's too, 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 too preoccupied figuring out a slight position. It's got to be something that you don't have, barely think about it. You can absolutely concentrate on the sound. Does that make sense? So uh, let me talk my my bolero well, story. So when I was my freshman in uh, 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 in, in college in, in a school, Austria, I got to play bolero right first time. Yeah, and uh, I, w I was super scared. And I remember very clearly the first rehearsal. I'm sitting there and you're supposed to play. Right, and I'm and, and I'm shaking. I'm, so instead of going. I went so you don't see like a whole because all, all I could think about was it's high it's high just squeeze in and go right <laughs> just go for it and if you know Bolero and David all you guys know really well what's the chord it's right below us it's a dominant seven chord so the you know it's sometimes easier to hear is actually the C so my probably my ear just jumped to that one and went with it and then my teacher went, no, no, look, calm down. He went to the piano, played the chord, make sure you hear this, no, be so, ba, 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 and then, no big deal. So what I'm trying to say is at that point I had, that's maybe where you were going with it. I had, you know, my muscles were developed. I had the correct muscle memory, but I was shooting in the wrong place. So it didn't matter what I did here, here, here. If I don't, didn't know absolutely 100% what I wanted to sound like, it would not happen. I'm talking too much. Anybody else? Sorry. Can I just throw in two cents a little bit? Something that helped me a lot. That's great stuff, by the way. I think if you're not hearing it, then it's kind of no hope in a way. <laughs> it's like driving with your eyes closed and going on instruments or something, you know? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But the problem, um, we don't admit that for ourselves sometimes, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, we don't, yeah. I'm not humble enough to admit that. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, the thing, thing for me is that I, I always had this problem when I was in, in college is that I, I would try to hear it and I would do all that, but I still wouldn't get the note because I think my embouchure just hadn't really been developed in the right way. And so um, I know I don't, a lot of people don't like to think about their embouchure too much uh, because you can overanalyze it and get all twisted around. Um, but for me personally, when I figured out how to think about my embouchure without getting 
paralyzed by it essentially, then I could actually work on it. And that helped me a lot. Uh, was actually, I, I personally had to develop my embouchure. Something that helped me a lot was um, actually using a, a rim, a rim buzzing, because I felt that sort of, uh, one is it would give me immediate feedback if I was on pitch. And I was shocked when I would record myself and find out how far off I was and not knowing it, which was, you know, again, coming back to what you're saying, Lucas, is like making sure that you know what you're aiming for and it's not just a high note somewhere up there. And then, uh, but also it would help, it would give me feedback for if my air and my embouchure were structured in a way that would receive, uh, so that would receive the vibration, if that makes any sense. And I found when I started doing a lot of rim buzzing, I could suddenly go to like the F which and, and above, which was not something I could do beforehand. So that was kind of a um, game changer for me personally. Uh, but I mean, it is going very much hand in hand with what you're saying about hearing it, because if you don't hear it, then, you know, it, 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 there's, it's like a chef trying to make a curry and not knowing what a curry should taste like, <laughs> you know, it just doesn't work, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and I, I think you're absolutely right about, you know, this has got to be in the right place and you got to develop that. And there's, that's a great strategy. And there are several other strategies to develop this. Uh, the reason I focus so much in the whole hearing part of it is because uh, I don't think people truly understand that they cannot hear it. And one thing you said is really key is when you record yourself singing or buzzing and you listen, make it like, man, I'm not even close. And when you do, you think you are. Right. Uh, so de developing strategies to figure out if you really understand what you're hearing or not, uh, it's key. Yet, it's again, there's a level of humbleness that it takes to do things like this, like record yourself and listen back and not be and analyze it non emotionally and objectively to figure out what needs to be better. You know, it's funny if I can chime in real quick, I think Dave and Lucas, I think you basically just hit the two, like the yin and the yang of like what it takes. And it seems like most players have a deficiency with one or the other, either they're not really hearing it. And so like Lucas, you're over here, they're not really hearing it, or they haven't trained this to work in a way that's going to make it successful. And it seems like it's always just one of no, nobody's ever missing both of them. Cause like if um, you know, the muscles in our face, like, when we eat and when we smile and when we talk and when we swallow things, like they're trained to do those things. None of those things require um, endurance, you know, to like to hold positions, you know, for a long time, like it does to play the instrument. Sometimes when people practice the trombone, they develop that physically, but you can play the trombone and not develop that. And if you don't have it developed, then you're trying to hear it and hear it and hear it. So usually your ears get pretty well trained. You just don't have the mechanism. Right. Whereas if you have a really strong mechanism, you don't need to rely on your ears to get you through. So you often develop a habit of not really engaging the ears in the same way. So when you run into problems, it's usually that you have been relying on whichever side you are stronger at and you need to go the other way and figure out for me, my ears have been well trained because my face sucks. And so I've really had to go back and train my face, but there are other players who have a great face. And they're just not listening because they've always relied on their face. It's always, you know, gotten the job done until it got harder. Yeah. And so I think if you put those two together, you really get the whole story. That's huge. You know, I remember a lesson with Pete that was kind of mind blowing. He would always say, man, you know, you have so much muscle and you, like, you can play, but you have no endurance, you know, because you're just, oh, you know, uh, uh, and, and he actually made me stop buzzing. I used, used to buzz, you know, 20 minutes right before, and Pete Ellis is a huge buzzer, but he's like, no, stop, because I, I would do a lot of free buzzing and stuff. And it's not that he's against buzzing, but yeah, I, I was, like you're saying, I was relying way too much on that feeling here to produce it, and I was not listening and not blowing it, air. Yeah. Uh, so that was life-changing for me, you know, like, uh, but again, I had to face something that was, again, very, it's still difficult for me to face that I'm not as good as a musician as I would like to be every morning. Yeah, it's, and, and that's a really big point because you need a teacher who recognizes what's going on and can point you in a direction because if, you know, like, okay, my face stinks, so I work on the physicality, but if I have a student who's very strong and they're just not listening, but I try to train them, like I try to teach them as if, 
they have my situation, that's not what they need. Like it's not going to be helpful. So it's really important, you know, if you're teaching people, it's important to to really have an idea of, you know, what their needs are. And that's huge. Can I, can I ask another question that came through the chat? Um, how do we manage attacks from the piano? So I believe we're talking about clarity of articulation, clarity of attacks in uh, piano or very soft registers. Um, uh, so basically sometimes we're getting like, it sounds like the, uh, the, the air is going but the lips aren't vibrating. Can we speak to that a little bit? Uh, if, if, you know, maybe I'm jumping in here too soon, but um... I think there are several things, and uh, and even though like you hear the air, I think maybe air doesn't really co have the correct energy in it for that for that uh, soft playing. Because I think often when we play soft, and again I may get a little controversial here, but we think too much of slow air and stuff like this, and we don't allow air to actually move properly. Air needs to move through and freely through the horn in order to produce sound. Uh, right, uh, and it's not just to be clear, it's not a lot of air, it's just gonna move. So, sometimes when you think slow air, uh, or, or like in you like piano, it, you just simply don't allow motion, and when you don't allow free motion, there'll be no sound, even though it may, you may hear like type of sound, but it, it needs to hear enough to move through. Right, so I think that for me, that's key. And of course, one thing that's, if you don't spend time working on that specifically, that's not gonna get better, right? So in trombone players, sometimes we don't spend enough time working on dynamics. So that's the thing that Pete also was very big on. It's like, you gotta work on your dynamics daily. Sorry, that, those are my two cents. Anybody else? I could throw in a little bit about it. Um, actually, I can share a resource. Um, um, I struggle. Well, I, I don't want to say I, it's hard for everyone <laughs> doing that. Quiet playing is like way harder than loud playing, I think, for everybody. I think that we're all in agreement on that. And the thing is, it's like it, you don't have any glory. Everyone wants to play these loud Bruckner moments, like Bruckner 8, and think, oh, yeah, this is great, you know, but then the. The chorales, like the Schumann three, that's like uh, <laughs> that's a terrifying moment. Um, so uh, I got turned on to a system uh, by Carmine Caruso, and it's a system of just um, I can I can share the 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 oh, just some or if you could just Google link to, or a web link to it. Um, uh, it's an exercise I started doing. It really helped with the production, and it really helped me with my soft playing. Um, and again, uh, maybe this is a reflection of my training and or kind of like my things that I developed earlier on, the things I had to develop later, but having developed my embouchure later, um, I think a lot of that actually for me was embouchure work and getting the embouchure structured so that the lips could then receive the vibration of the air. For me, if the embouchure wasn't formed, then uh, I could blow all the right air, but I wouldn't get a buzz, you know? So, um, but then again, that's, um, yeah, that's kind of more long. Um, that thing. Let me see if I can find that link. But the the Caruso exercise has helped me a lot with with production of the soft registers. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, he's living here. But uh, David, I have a question about you. Yeah, yeah. Your your background. Mm -hmm. uh, did you do you have any musical training before playing the trombone? And uh, just tell me about your background. That that makes me very curious. Oh right. Uh, well, I had piano lessons for like a hot minute. But it was a really, uh, the teacher was not very nice. And I think she terrified me. So I had a few lessons and then I stopped going. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my, and no, I, I played the trombone in the fifth grade. And so that was the total beginner. For, for me, it was all messed up because I had, I, I had braces when I was a kid and no private teacher. So I did all this weird stuff with the mouthpiece, put in different places. And my music teacher at the time was a saxophonist who is a great musician. I mean, I learned so much about him about like ear training and understanding rhythms and just things like that. So my base of music study was like really, really good. But in terms of brass pedagogy, it was not. So I went to college. I had teachers be like, oh, we got to move your embouchure. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that, you know. <laughs> and so I kind of went into and then ended up in an orchestra with like, uh, you know, able to like function, you know, on the trombone, but also not having a lot of the refined stuff I, I wanted to be able to do with the instrument. 
I couldn't do. So I when I, I eventually went to London and I stayed with Ian Bousfield uh, and Dudley Bright and Dennis Wick and, and had a lot more structured like a uh, study of how the Amish should work, Amish should work there. My experience then at least was that in at least the British system, they spend a lot more time focusing on Amish, whereas I found in the US system, they're spending a lot more time focusing just on air. And if you can sort of wed those two and put them together, I think it's really powerful. So, so the reason I asked is it was exactly, so you understand, you know, like, like, like you said, you know, you, you had to figure a lot of things about your chops, mm -hmm. like Jason was saying, because that was, that was, those were your deficiencies, but it, that's because you had a very strong musical background, right? Right. Uh, based on what you're saying. And in some people, even sometimes they have strong musical backgrounds, that's not a formal training. Like, uh, do you guys know who José Milton is? Brazilian trombonist was beast. Uh, should look him up. Oh, yeah. He's, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, he's ridiculous. But, you know, he grew up, you know, in an evangelical church in Brazil. And his parents listened to, like, listened to a lot of music. And his church was very, very musical. So the amount of musicianship he was brought in as a child, uh, you know, and, and then he's, he wanted to play piano and sing and could sing way before playing the trombone. And I still think that's one of the key things for him to play. So I know he had really good teachers on the way too, which made him have a strong amateur all of this stuff. But I see a lot of the great players, like not talking about the good ones, I'm not talking people like you, which I think you want amazing players. All of them really have fundamentally good music, musical training. And mm -hmm. even if, if it's not formal, and when I mean fundamental, it's before they're 18, way before. Like in their first child uh, 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 infancy, first and second infancy, they have good ex exposure to music in a high level, and I think that's really key. Uh, and and uh, a lot a lot of times, at least my students, they really do not have their part, right? And, and that's where it gets very tricky, uh, uh, because often, even though Jason was saying a lot of people don't have both problems, but a lot of them will have the, both problems because they, you know, the trombones this way. The mm -hmm. is all, uh, and they cannot hear it, right? Uh, so I, I think Jason hit on the name when he said, it's, it's, as a teacher, it's, you got to figure out what the, where the issue is and what the primary issue is, right? It's cool that because when you go to England, like you said, they, were, they obviously knew that you were a good musician because, you know, in those schools you were not getting, if you're not have a good level of musicianship, and they're like, well, now we can fix your little problems and you yeah. can really get to the next level. It seems to me that it was that, that way. I'm always in, interested in everybody on background to see mm -hmm. why they are where they are and how, how things came about for them. Yeah. Sorry, talking too much. No, 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 you're not. This, this is great. This is fantastic stuff. Yeah, I think also like, actually Jason got me put onto an idea too for the high register is that um, I, I had been to an audition years ago where I they asked to way too many excerpts in the last round, like like 15 excerpts in the last, second round. And I, my embouchure just, I couldn't make it, you know? And I talked to, was talking to Jason afterwards. He was like, well, where do you consider this middle note, uh, middle register of your instrument, you know? And I was like, oh yeah, I guess middle B flat. And he's like, why don't you like shift it up a fifth? So the F above the staff, that's your middle note. And I was like, well, okay, I'll just stole all my long tones from there, you know? And then that will be, and then, uh, and I kind of just conceptually made that as the middle. And the first couple of days, I was I was exhausted after five minutes of my warm up. And I thought, well, you know, if I'm gonna actually do this as my warm up, I can't be tired. So I have to just find out how to do this efficiently. And I noticed my embouchure shifted, and I actually did structure my embouchure differently there. And I have this theory that some people, when they start off in their Rubank Elementary method in the fifth grade or something like that, the first note they learn is a low B flat, and you can play that with not with an embouchure that works in that register, but may not work in the upper register. But then the, me the method book just keeps stacking notes on top. And so they try to take that sort of low embouchure and sort of ratchet it up to the higher notes. And then it doesn't work. You know what I mean? And so maybe if you say, so my approach was like, what if I just take my F register, like that embouchure, which is now my middle note in my mind, and extend that embouchure downwards. And I, there was this shifting period, but then after a while, uh, that was another little breakthrough I had. So, but I think also a lot of, a lot of it had to do with like how we learn and what, uh, 
just how we start the first couple notes when we first played the horn what where we just how it kind of worked out for us you know so you know sorry david you're giving me too much i want to talk too much it's too it's okay. much go for it go for it it's okay but you know one guy you know i think all of us kind of respecting joe alessi right all of us i know is amazing and joe and like many other musicians started as a trumpet player right and his, he was essentially forced to, into be a trombone player by his father. He didn't want to do it. But he says that the first one he picked up the trombone, the first one he played was a high B flat. He was blowing like a trumpet player. Right? And, and, and that seems small. But in the really long run, like you were saying, that, that was the starting point. Instead of being all shift towards the bottom, was shift in the higher end of the horn and, and then it developed from there so I, I just think that what you said is it's huge it's huge and often we, we neglect that right and i think we neglect as far as amateur goes is allowing the amateur to go when it needs to go uh not, i don't know jacob talks about this maybe with different words but uh we sometimes we like you know i play here and all that and then I, when i go low i don't allow things to change to the new place uh, and some people will talk about the pivot system and stuff like this. I have a little problem with the pivot system because it seems to be a little too mechanic. But, but for instance, Jim Markey talks a lot about like when he goes low, some, you know, he, he moves all over to make sure he finds, and that's, I find that's really important. I've been really checking a lot of physics things. Where does the horn resonate at its best? And that's our goal, right? To make sure, sure the horn, uh, there's a point of resonance for each note, for each length of the tube. And we got to figure out what's the perfect response for that point. And Jim Marcus seems to have fed that figure out. You know, as he goes low, he allows whatever shift necessary. Uh, and of course, he trains that and he makes them automatic, like you were talking about. So he's always finding the optimal uh, resonance in the tube all the time. Uh, but if you're too stiff and you don't, don't allow changes to happen, you lose that. You know, Joel, I see, there's a recent view of him that he talks about, like, with the years getting old, his armature in place has changed. Because your body will change, right? So sometimes you get too locked in what you learn with your great teacher when you were in middle school or in your college or whatever. You may run into trouble much later. You, you got to allow things to change. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect sense. Yeah, spot on. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Our embouchures change. I think I also kind of have this idea that changing an embouchure shouldn't be that complicated. Like, I, I one time I changed my embouchure two days before an audition and I actually won. <laughs> 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 I was, but it was all about, I don't know, I don't know how it worked, but I remember it was just like, I was trying something and I did something different. I was like, oh, that's like, it, 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 I could tell the sound had a lot more spring to it, but it was a bit messy because my lip wasn't used to vibrating in that way. And I remember thinking like, oh, my audition's in two days. Should I just go for it? And it, was a, it wasn't a, a big job. It was like a little kind of regional thing. So it, I, I kind of thought, well, if I, if I make a fool out of myself, you know, it's okay, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I was also kind of knew enough sense to kind of angle my bell away from the committee so they didn't hear the fuzz. So uh, I was a little you know clever about it but but i but i won and i think my idea is that like if if the embouchure change is a good change it should work within like a couple days so i personally don't buy into this idea like i i would hear students in college say oh i'm changing my embouchure and so uh i can't play an orchestra for the next semester and you know don't give me any solos or anything like that and you know for a few months and i i think well you know, a baby figures how to walk in a, you know, much shorter period of time than most people change their embouchures. So if we just take the same approach, but always like making it, uh, focusing on the result, you know, if, if you get the articulation you like, if you get the sound you like, if you get the fluidity that you like, then that works. And then you just got to do that, you know, that's my two cents. <laughs> That's obviously a very touchy and tricky subject it's because, you know, one thing it's a small change and another thing it's a completely redo, right? Some people go from, you know, I've seen people that have really extreme amateurs that are extremely inefficient and they got to move. I'm talking about Toby Off, for instance, right? He had an extreme, uh, you know, and in that case, 
it was it, it wasn't minor it was huge so i, I think in case like this maybe you, you need to take a semester off or stuff like this mm -hmm. but you're right i think there are a bunch of small changes that can be made as long as they're made for the best why not i, I know I, I agree with you and including myself I, too much fear of changing anything yeah. but change will happen right yeah. Jason, yeah. talk a little bit otherwise. I mean, the only th I, I think it's great, and you know, I, I talk for a living, so sometimes I just sit back and just love to uh, you know hear everybody's ideas. And um, the only thing I would say is that I think sometimes, like, if you're uh, if you hear sounds and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I want to sound like that, I think your amateur will change when you're not looking. You know, like th there will be some kind of physical manifestation of your attempts to make that come out through the other end of the belt. So I think sometimes when we refer to embouchure, we think it's this like rigid thing. There's nothing in the body that is like rigid. Like when you pick up something with your arm, like I'm picking up my phone, as I age, you know, time of day, like the muscles that the way that they coordinate to pick up the phone, it's gonna change. Like it's just, there's a variability. And then like our bodies just tend to react to the situations that they're, they're put in. And so, yeah, we have a basic idea of like a consistent amateur, but I actually, I've started to try to remove the word consistent from my, from my teaching and from my, my thought, because the concept of consistent, I think is a double-edged sword, you know, because we're just, things are constantly evolving and things are constantly adapting. So I think, you know, and, and that ties back into your idea of just, you know, having that sound in your mind and having a very clear idea of where you want to go. And then that kind of, sets us in the right direction it kind of figures things out so i i think that you know yeah sometimes we get too wrapped up in amateur frankly in that in that way but, but anyway i i love hearing you talk because you're so technical and so precise about your language it's, it's just amazing but i think you're absolutely right uh, uh, a lot of people having to flint now maybe, maybe it might be a good time yeah yeah we might uh, well you know we'll just have to have you back sometime we'll do the second half we'll do like the the gripping conclusion of, of warm-up part two and we'll We'll just start right on the lengthy slurs. Well, I, my right life. I didn't have to play the high notes, so good. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's great, great, Lucas. It's been wonderful to have you. And uh, it's just, it's wonderful to, you know, get a chance to talk, but to hear you play and to hear your ideas.